The first question is regarding semiconductor memory. <coughs> Intel was founded as a semiconductor memory in 1968 with the singular objective of replacing core memories. Along the way, there were other memory applications and systems experience. But the watershed event for Intel, which I don't think anyone here except the insiders appreciate, was their 1K DRAM. It was the make or break event from in, for Intel. Most of you don't know that the 11, 1103 had a press, predecessor. It was the 1102. And according to our planning meeting, Dave said that while a designer, CPU designer at Honeywell, Intel came to Honeywell, brought the 1K concept. And then later, Dave was involved in the 1103, the successor, at Microdata, Microdata, where he was debugging memory systems as the CPU designer. So let's start with Dave telling us the story of the 1102 and the 1103, and then Ted will chime in and add his perspective. Do you mind if I stand up? I can't, no, I can't please. see anybody. Please. Um, so I was hired at Honeywell Computer Control Division in Framingham, Massachusetts, uh, back in uh, 1968 to design a new computer, a mini computer, an 8-bit machine because DEC had a 12-bit PDP-8 and we had a 16-bit, 116, 516, so we're going to bracket them. And uh, anyway, I'm designing this machine, what? charge of the development of this machine, when um, the head of my, the memory department, because I just had the CPU, I subcontracted the memory, uh, came to me and said, I want to put a semiconductor memory in your X12 machine. I said, semiconductor memory, what's that? He said, well, use this new thing called a DRAM. I said, what's a DRAM? He said, dynamic, random Oh, what's so dynamic about it? Well, it charges, it saves charge on a capacitor. And I said, how's that going to work? And he said, well, you have to refresh it off in every millisecond. I said, oh, no. No, no, we're not. <laughs> we're not doing that. We're doing a core memory. That's why I'm paying for it. Go back and do it. He comes to me later and he says, well, you know, I've got some of my own internal R&D money and I'd like to do a card that's compatible with your core memory. I'll do the core, but, you know, compatible. And so I met Bob Noyce because he was going to use the 1102 1K DRAM. Out of some original work in Honeywell Framingham and uh, Intel, we had actually our own semiconductor processing facility there and we didn't make any production chips, but we did some engineering chips. And there'd been some discussion about DRAMs, et cetera, and that's how the link got caught up. So I think it was probably the first commercial application of the, what was 1102. One day, Bill Jordan, who's the guy in charge of the memory uh, division, comes to me and he says, Dave, I gotta come over here, I gotta show you, the memory's working. Take him over to the lab. He's got a little tester box here and he's got the card uh, in there and he's got the tester running and it's going through its addresses. And, and I, but I look at it and, the, and this, all these 14 pin or 16 pin dual inline packages, ceramic packages with gold lids, had a wire soldered to the top of every one <laughs> and went around to a power supply up here on the bench. And I said, What's that? And he said, Well, we figured out we had a back bias and substrate, and there was no, that's connected to the, uh, to the base and that's connected to the gold top. And so, we, you know, we, I said, Well, how are you going to do this? He said, Well, I don't know. <laughs> I said, well, we can't have a wire soldered it up. So next thing I know, I get the email. It's called uh, it's subject, uh, or the uh, memo. We didn't have emails. It was a memo. <laughs> <laughs> and the subject line was the industry standard 18-pin dip. And I, went, I said, there's just no 18-pin dip. But well, there will be. And sure enough, uh, when the 1103 came out, it was in the 18-pin dip. And uh, 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 wound up being we were able to offer a semiconductor and a core uh, memory of the machine. But Ted can now tell the story on the chip side of what was happening, because Ted was at Intel while I was at Honeywell. <laughs> oh, poor Ted. Yeah. If no we more. could put up that slide. And why it didn't work. Well. <laughs> yeah. well, I don't know if we can control it. Intel's it first memory device in MOS was actually a static RAM, the 1101, 256 bits. I don't think we would have thought about doing a DRAM if Honeywell hadn't brought some concept to us. And they had, if we can get more, can we get that? It's the 1102 cell. I think it's probably one more, just one, one, one more behind back. this. Yeah. This so, is it here. Yeah. Okay. Just leave it like that. Yeah. yeah. Now, 
This had a single word. Of, no, this is actually the 1103 cell. There's a okay, we got to go back. <laughs> back up two more. Two more. But anyway, that one. This is it. It has a single select line, and the idea is. This transistor labeled 10 is for writing, and the one labeled 20 or 25 is for reading. Now, it was a clever idea to try to uh, get a single word line, but one day, Les Videz, who was in charge of the MOS group, came to me and said, we're having a terrible time with this product. The reason is that, you see, you have to put a bias on this line to read the cell it's got to be more than one threshold voltage above the turn-on voltage of that transistor labeled 25. But when that happens, it tries to turn this transistor on, which acts as a source follower and starts to charge up the storage node. So you've got to get a voltage that's between one and two thresholds, and hopefully on the high side of one point something threshold, or this little Let's see. Oh, there you go. So anyway, they were having a terrible time getting the bias circuit to work for this. So I said to Les, I said, well, how bad would it be if we use separate read and write select lines? And he said, well, let's try it. And it worked. <laughs> now, he said to me, you know, I think we ought to file for a patent. I said, somebody must have done that thing as a predecessor to this cell. But we went ahead and filed for the patent, and it issued. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out that it actually had some features in it. One of the things that we recognized in the patent when you try to select the 1102 and you have this very low voltage, just a little over a threshold, it's trying to discharge that uh, data line and it's very slow. So by going to the two select lines, it sped the access time up a lot. And we covered that in the, in the patent. Well, that was one aspect of it. At least this was one way to get around it. But then there was another issue. You know, I was in charge of an applications group, and we had to hopefully provide information for customers about using the part. So I went to some of the designers, and I said, you know, how much power does this thing use? How big a power supply do I need if I'm going to put, you know, you know, 64 of these things on a circuit board to make a 4K by 16 memory or something. Well, anyway, he says, well, it's a function of what the address is. Oh, that's interesting. So how does it work out? Well, it, it worked out that if all of the addresses were in one state, it exceeded the maximum dissipation allowed for the package the chip would get too hot and self-destruct. I said, well, that can't be good. He says, well, on the average, he said, the address lines are always half ones and half zeros. So I had to immediately try to come up with something. I said, well, how about I've got the computer sitting over here, and it's not doing anything except waiting for an interrupt. And so while it's waiting for the interrupt, I'm going to put it just in a little loop, jump to itself, a type of instruction. And the programmer just happens to put that thing in the address that maximizes the dissipation. So while it's waiting for the interrupt, the memory goes up in smoke. <laughs> and so more than anything, that probably killed the 1102. <laughs>